All right, so I don't really have that much time, so let me just uh, say a few words about myself first. So I've been, I've been um, using Linux for over 20 years. I've, I've been working on a Linux kernel for over 12 years, I think. Uh, I've been a maintainer of, of subsystems in the kernel uh, since 2009. I mostly work on power management and ACPI. Uh, yeah, I work at Intel uh, Open Source Technology Center doing that stuff. I mean, mainline kernel development and maintenance, mostly. Um, okay, today I'm going to talk about some changes we made in the, in the CPU frequency uh, control subsystem in the kernel last year. It is like we, it has been redesigned, or was redesigned, basically. Uh, the, the basic design was changed, and that I, I'm going to talk about why that was necessary or, or why we decided to, do, to make those changes and then what, what, what happened when it, when it happened, right? Uh, so first off, the goal of that the whole power management in the CPU area is to optimize the energy consumption by CPUs. Where optimize doesn't mean sacrificing performance. It means preventing energy from being wasted rather than sacrificing anything for like battery life. Uh, usually we want things to happen as fast as possible, uh, e even though that costs energy. There are three components of that thing. Uh, the first two of them are quite obvious. These are a CPU frequency control subsystem. This is a, the CPU uh, idle states control subsystem. They are about, obviously about power management. That scheduler is not a component that everybody pictures as a power management subsystem. But of course it, ha it can influence power management Say so what the scheduler does is to, uh, to decide on which task is going to run on what CPU and when. And in particular, it can, it, it can decide that, that some CPUs will not run any tasks at all. And that obviously affects power management, right? Because then those CPUs can go idle and then draw less power and so on. So there are three components. Obviously, they have to be aligned with each other to, for things to work, and if you picture that wheel or the diagram is the wheel in a, in a, in a uh, vehicle like that, then you can, you can imagine that if those are not aligned properly, the user experience may not be fantastic, right? So we have to do something to make them work together. Uh, what happened in the past, I mean, in, in, the, in Linux 4.5 and earlier, was that the CPU frequency control subsystem was not aligned with everything else. So the user experience, you know. Um, okay, so first of all, to, to explain why, why we made those changes I, I'm going to talk about later, I need to talk about how that worked before to give you the idea why that was necessary or why it was necessary to change things. So first of all, uh, there, there, there were and there are two basic uh, to basic variants of CPU frequency control. One, one of them is what I call an Intel P-State variant, and the reason why uh, for that name is, is that Intel P-State driver is the, is the mo most widely used uh, implementation of that. And the other one uh, is the generic, uh, generic governor's uh, approach that I will be talking about later. So let's just start with the Intel P-State variant, which is simpler. So, before we made those changes, it worked like that. Uh, so this is per CPU, per logical CPU. Uh, every logical CPU that may be a hardware thread or a core uh, is uh, handled separately. So the, 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 whole, the, the whole cycle works from setting up a timer and then the timer fires after some time, of course. Uh, the utilization of the CPU is estimated by the driver by reading some feedback registers and doing computations on them. Uh, then the performance is adjusted to reflect, to reflect the utilization and then 
the timer is set up again, and this, and this closes the cycle. The, the, the arrow on the, on the right-hand side represents the initialization of that. So uh, it, it was running in cycles like that for every, CP, every logical CPU in the system. So there was a timer per CPU that would, that would fire every, say, 10 milliseconds into something. Uh, so there are two problems, or, or uh, there is a number of problems. <laughs> this will just say. Uh, the first problem is the timer itself, but I, I will get back to that later. Uh, the second one is that this was not, you know, it, not aligned with anything that the scheduler did. So the scheduler might be in the middle of, I don't know, uh, uh, between, between, say, um, between ticks and then the uh, timer fired and then it, it did something while a task was running uh, on, on a CPU. So it, say we have a real-time task that, that is running, it, it wants or it needs the full speed from the CPU and now the driver uh, estimates the utilization, which is a past utilization, it's not instantaneous. It is a past utilization. The driver says, oh, we were not doing anything interesting on the CPU before, so let's just reduce the frequency, right? And now the, the real-time task doesn't get full speed and so on. So th this really is not aligned with what the scheduler was doing. Um, also, the utilization estimation was not aligned with the scheduler's idea about the utilization which Maybe, yeah, I, I will get back to that part later. So there is, there is a couple of reasons to change that. So this is the first, uh, the, the first, um, the first variant of CPU frequency uh, control. The second one is a bit more complicated. Uh, it works, the, so in this diagram, it is, it is pictured for, or illustrated for, for, for a per CPU variant again. So per logical CPU, there's one, uh, th uh, th there's a timer for, for CPU, there's a, um, so the timer, when it fires, gives up an, a, 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 a work item, which then would estimate the utilization and then adjust the performance in accordance with it. Uh, there are two components of this. One is the governor and the second one is the driver. So the governor uh, sort of, uh, runs the framework, right? It sets up the timer, then queues up a work item, runs the utilization estimation, and then calls the driver to just, to, to, to just adjust the performance uh, as needed by the hardware. There is one additional component here that is consulted for some information, so to estimate the utilization, the governor has to know how much time the CPU was idle and how much time it was running, and this, this comes from the timekeeping sub subsystem which uh, knows about idle periods and, uh, and, uh, and about time in general, right? So the, it gives us a, the ratio of idle time to total time the CPU was running, and from that we can say, oh, this is how, uh, this is the load of the CPU, so this is how busy it was. Okay, so that has the problems the previous variant had, plus, uh, there is one additional or two additional things. There is an additional wake up here because we, when we queue up a work item, it has to wake up at one point and do something. So there is an additional wake up and there is a, uh, a task switch involved. So this, uh, which doesn't need to be necessary. And um, yeah, and, 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 and all of the problems I was talking about before are here too. So, but this is, so, so this was problematic already, but th that's, that's not where it ends, uh, because there are systems in which CPUs cannot be, uh, so the power management of CPUs cannot be handled per, on a per CPU basis because the CPUs are in packages or in clusters or, or somehow together, 
and they share power resources. So we can't really uh, adjust performance for just one CPU that, that may be necessary to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to be done for multiple CPUs at the same time. And in those cases, uh, the set of CPUs to be handled together is represented by a CPU-freak policy object. Uh, for that object, in that object, there are multiple logical CPUs, and now for, uh, we, we have to set a timer for each of those logical CPUs. Then there is only one uh, work item run when one of those ti timers fires, and it does all the work, and again, after this is done, we have to set up a timer for every logical CPUs, the CPU that belongs to the CPU-freak policy. That introduces a set of problems by itself to the extent that it is not possible or it was not possible to actually avoid all of the race conditions and, and all of the deadlocks at the same time. Because this is like, you have to, uh, it has to be uh, made work with, this, with, with the SysFS interface. So when we adjust some tunables via SysFS, that all of those timers have to be canceled synchronously, the new setting has to be made uh, work, and then all, all of that has to be started again, and all of that has to be made work with this, uh, with this cycle, and that turned out to be impossible essentially. So, yeah, so, so people had been trying to make that work for a year or so, and they, then they decided, well, the timers had to go. And I said that the timer was a problem by itself, and, and, and it, it was a problem for two reasons. So the first one was that it had to run from the timer wheel, which is one of the ways to manage timers in the Linux kernel. But the timer wheel, assumes that, uh, that the timers in it would never fire, or, or at least they would fire very, uh, very infrequently, and they are just used for timeouts. So if there is a timeout which, is, which uh, passes, then it will, it will cause the timer to fire, but in general, the timers would be, the timer wheel timers would be canceled before they had a chance to, to fire. And that causes the, the management of that, of, of all of those timers to be easier. But unfortunately for those CPU-free timers, it was not the case, they would just fire every time. So that is, that, is, that, that causes the, the, the timekeeping development or maintenance uh, to be a bit of a problem. Uh, now, the second, the second reason why the timer was a problem by itself was that the timer was the deferrable one. And now the deferrable means that the timer, could, it doesn't mean that the timer could be deferred for any reason, it means that the timer could be, would not, uh, would not wake up the CPU from idle states. And that's what deferrable is, okay? So, the, but this is a problem because it is not like it is easy to say when the CPU is going to go into the, into the idle state up front. So when we set up the next timer event, it had to be uh, somehow figured out whether or not uh, to, to, to really set up the timer interrupt, right? So the, there, there were a few reasons to get rid of those things, and that's what happened. Like in Linux 4.6, we actually dropped the timers and we switched over to, uh, to, to, to callbacks invoked by the, by the CPU scheduler. And it all, or, uh, and it all works like that. This is, this is the Intel P-State variant. This is a generic governor's variant uh, without the timers. So there is a function invoked by, this, by the scheduler whenever it, it, it thinks it is necessary to update uh, the, f the frequency or p-state of the CPU. Uh, it, it is invoked per CPU, per logical CPU, so for uh, every uh, hardware thread in particular. And uh, what, it, what it does, it just invokes the governor, the, the governor callback, the callback regist registered and provided by the CPU frequency governor, 
which then estimates the utilization in this case and then adjusts performance and that's when it ends. It doesn't have to set up, set up a timer again and do all of the timer management stuff, it just does that. And you can figure out that this happens in the scheduler context actually, all of it without leaving the scheduler context. Now in this case, uh, the generic governors, again, we have the CPU uh, update util function invoked by the scheduler, which then invokes the, the, the governor callback. Then a queue item is, the, the, the work item is queued up, which estimates the utilization using that information provided by the timekeeping subsystem, and the, and the driver is called to adjust performance. And again, no timer is, the, doesn't have to cancel anything, timer management is not necessary, and so on. So this is just simple, simpler and reduces the number of interrupts in the system, which is nice. Uh, the drawback is that now it is, there, is a, there is a scheduler overhead related to invoking those things. But that fortunately it turns out that this is not a great overhead and then can be tolerated. Right, so the timers were gone. But there still is a problem here that the utilization actually is estimated in a different way here and different way here. And, uh, and the scheduler may think that, may have a different idea about it again. So the next step was to, to switch over to the scheduler's utilization data as the, as the estimate or as the metric for, uh, for, for CPU load or CPU utilization. So the scheduler has it for different reasons. Uh, in the CFS scheduling class, which is the, the most widely used thing, uh, it is used for the majority of, of tasks in the system, usually. There is something called PELT, or per entity load tracking. Uh, the way it works is, uh, it, Compute the series uh, like that, where L0, L1, L2, L3, and so on are contributions from uh, different time intervals. So the time is divided into small intervals. Each interval is given a number, and for which interval it, it computes, and the, again, a number represented the load in this particular interval. And that number is just the ratio of the, uh, of the time, this, the, 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 the task or a scheduling entity in general was runnable, which means that either running or waiting for the CPU to, to be available to it, uh, the, the runnable time uh, over the, the total length of this, uh, of this interval. Now, so L0, L0 is for the, the most recent interval, L1 is for the second most recent interval, and so on. And now there is the, the, each of the, of the past contributions is multiplied by a weight computed as a, as a power of, of a of certain number in, with this property. Uh, now this, so first of all, it takes past into account not just the, the most recent interval, but also the, it, it extends into the past. And second, it is very easy to compute. So if you have a, a value of it for, for a given interval, it, it takes just the mul multiplication by Q and addition of the current contribution to it, and you get the next value. So it is, it is easy to compute, it is, uh, and it is quite useful too. So we can, we can use that thing to, uh, to, to, to provide a formula for the next frequency uh, in, in the CPU frequency control subsystem. Namely, we can just say that the new frequency will be proportional to this, to this uh, PELT number for the root C group uh, of the, uh, uh, yeah, root scheduler C group of, of, the, of the given CPU. That is when the PELT numbers are a frequency invariant, meaning that they, they uh, don't depend on, what, uh, on, the, on the current speed of the CPU. They are computed in a way that doesn't depend on that. 
it is not always the case, and if, if those numbers are not frequency invariant, uh, the right-hand side of this formula has to be substituted for L, L, L here, and then you get something like that, uh, which means that the new frequencies computed uh, from the current one uh, by means of multiplication like that, right? This is the uh, the row, row pelt number, and the, this is the theoret theoretical maximum of it, uh, and a C constant has to be, uh, has to be uh, determined somehow, and actually it has to be guessed, because there is no good way to determine it. So, even for the systems in which the uh, pelt numbers are, uh, frequency invariant. This is handy because it provides uh, it provides a a good way to guess this uh, C constant. Nam namely, we can say that well, there is a point somewhere where, where in this formula where the new frequency will be will be the same as as the current one, right? So we don't really switch the, to, to a new frequency; we just stay at the same level. And now the, this, the, the condition for that will, will tell us what the C is, right? So we, we can just, we can just uh, pick a ratio of L rho to L max and say this is, this is a uh, value for which we want to stay at the same frequency as before, and that, uh, that, is, uh, uh, the, uh, that is the condition for C. So we, we actually chose uh, 0 0.8, meaning uh, 80%, and that that is that is what what's in use today. Uh, so the problem with that is well, if we took all that and and put it into into the existing governor for CPU freak, they could not uh, they, they, that there, there might be regressions in them, right? So they they would behave differently. Uh, or and people who are who depend on the current behavior might be unhappy, so we decided to not to do that. And as and the, and the way forward was to actually introduce to introduce a new governor. Uh, the new governor is uh, called Schedule. It was introduced in Linux 4.7, uh, and it uses the Pelt-based uh, next frequency formula. That's it, right? Um, in addition to that. It has a feature that allows um, that allows to, to uh, get rid of the whole work queue thing if the driver could switch the frequency from the scheduler context, which actually happens to be the case for, for at least some drivers. And that's how it works. So we have this CPU freak update util function invoked by the scheduler. Now there's a governor call, callback that computes the frequency using the health numbers from the scheduler. And now, if the, if the driver can uh, switch frequencies from scheduler context, it will just call the driver and switch the frequency and be done. If the driver can't do it, it has to queue up a work item and then uh, have the driver just performance later when the, uh, when the, when the work is subsystem decides to, to execute this, this, this uh, work. All right, so this is the schedule to governor. Uh, on top of that, there are some more changes that, can be, that could be done. And, uh, and the first one was that, well, in addition to, uh, to just invoking the, the scheduler, uh, the, the, the governor callback, the scheduler could give it a, a hint uh, through this function to, to make it know like, or to let it know why the update was done. So it was the, the switch, uh, the context switch, or was the NQ, uh, the NQ of a new task or something like that. So there are events on the, in the scheduler that will trigger the, the, this, uh, the invocation of this function, and then the governor callback may want to know why it was invoked. So the hint is, is a way to, uh, to tell it uh, the reason for that. So today we have three different hints defined. One is that the update is related to a real-time task, and uh, the other one is that we uh, the given update is related to a deadline task. In both cases, the scheduler, uh, the schedule, schedule till governor actually 
uh, actually bumps up the frequency to the maximum for those two, uh, two types of hints. And there is one additional uh, hint that the task, the currently, uh, the current TNQ task was previously waiting on IO, which means that it would be bump up the it would be good to bump up the frequency for that task so it can uh, do whatever work is now. Uh, it, it can now do uh, after after having uh, received the I/O it wanted. Well, there also are uh, improvements in the Intel G State driver based on all that work I was talking about previously. Uh, so there is a new algorithm in, uh, for atom processors. Uh, it, it, and in particular, it doesn't use the P PID controller. It was used by the Intel PSTIC driver from day one. It didn't turn out to be that much useful. Uh, also, the Intel PSTIC driver, and when this, uh, this, this uh, PSTIC selection algorithm is used, it can actually use the, uh, the hints from the scheduler just like the uh, schedule governor. So that was done in Linux 4.9, and <coughs> there are some changes waiting for, uh, uh, for uh, well, the release of the new kernel, right? <laughs> they are in 4.10 RC. Uh, there, there, there was some work on the schedule to govern, or in particular, it was made use uh, real-time real-time tasks for, for the deferred execution instead of a work queue, which I don't really have the time to talk about why it was, why it is an improvement. And the second was, and also the Intel p driver had some improvements. Uh, so we decided to use the algorithm previously introduced for Atom processors for other systems that have, that are of the mobile type, like they have um, the, the ACPI tables to tell us that they are mobile. There is a passive mode in Intel state which makes it work with generic governors, so it, it switches the, the variant of uh, CPU frequency control from the Intel state variant to the generic governors, but the driver in use Intel, is Intel state. Uh, so let me go back a couple of slides. So here it would just, uh, the driver called here would, would be Intel state and it would, uh, adjust the performance as requested by the schedule to governor, for example, in a passive mode. And yeah, and there was some work on the, on the limits in it, so. And what's next? This is, this is the, my last slide, probably. What's next, uh, where this is all going? So there, there is a concept of energy-aware scheduling. Uh, it was, the, there is a working proof of concept implementation in Android of it. And the idea is basically that the scheduler should take uh, the information about, uh, about energy in, uh, in the scheduling decisions, right? So it, in addition to taking time into consideration, so Linux is a time sharing system, right? So, yeah, noticed? Uh, Linux is a time sharing system, so uh, the scheduler tries to give each task a fair share of time, but also it should take energy into account and uh, yeah, and make decisions to to minimize the, the, the energy consumption and without sacrificing performance if that's possible. Okay, everything else is in the slide. And that's my conclusion. So yeah, it, we had switched the way the CPU freak works uh, from timer-driven to scheduler-driven, uh, and we have a new governor, which is the scheduler-provided utilization metric. It can be built upon, so you can implement things like uh, energy or scheduling using that governor, for example. Uh, yeah. And that's where, where things are going today. So, questions to me? Uh, why was the focus only on mobile processors? Uh, why was the focus only on mobile processors? 
Um, I don't really. Like your improvements you said were for the Atom processor, were they not like relevant to other types of Intel processors? Uh, yeah, so the, um, so the use cases they are used for are different. Yeah, because the, so in the server world, it is not like people care that much about energy consumption, or if they do, they just shut off the, the entire server rather than, you know, trying to, but this is changing. I will be talking about it on Thursday, so. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, so, so the reason why we didn't decide to move ahead with this, with this new algorithm to other systems is because uh, it is substantially different from the existing one, and that's just for uh, like uh, the reason is to avoid regressions essentially. It's our, we, we have to make, it, make sure that it works better than the previous one before we switch over. So that hasn't happened yet. We are pretty confident about Atom and mobile systems, which by the way is probably your laptop as well because it will say from the ACPA tables that it is mobile. <laughs> right? <laughs> but Okay, but at least my laptops do that. So, or ACPA tables in my laptops say that they are mobile systems. So. That covers it neatly, but <laughs> but the processor is the same as for servers. I mean the type of the CPU, right? Um, um, how do you turn this on in config, or is it turned on anyway? On config, there is a so first of all <coughs> the timers thing. Oh, let me just, just, the timer thing here is just, you can't change it, just is, works like that for everybody, right, since it was introduced. The schedule governor has a config option to enable it, and you can make it a default governor as well through the config option, uh, which I do. So you're welcome to do that too, so. Uh, as far as for the Intel P-State, uh, passive mode, there is a command line uh, argument that you can pass to Intel P-State and tell it to, to work in the passive mode. I think that's all we have time for. Um, so thank you, Raphael.